Peace be with you. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy at Zion and Bethany Lutheran Churches, and this is your word at the middle of the week. We are continuing to study Revelation, the book of Revelation that uh, was recorded by the Apostle John, the beloved disciple, as he was given visions by God of God's work both now and in the future as he brings all things to a close and to fulfillment among us. A fulfillment that began when Jesus rose from the dead and that is still continuing and will come to its final completion at a time that the Father has appointed. We are waiting for Pastor Johnson to join us when he does so. We'll jump right into it. Uh, we've been listening to some angels blow some trumpets and uh, we, last week in particular we were looking at chapter 9 and then moving into chapter 10 of Revelation. So we will continue that path. Oh, there's Pastor Johnson now. And let's add him. Hello, Pastor Johnson. Good morning, Pastor Gertie. How are you this morning? I am very well. Yourself, sir? I'm very well. Thank you very much. So we are in chapter 10. We didn't really go, go through all of chapter 10 very, very thoroughly. <laughs> At least that's my no, memory. We, no, we read it and said, to be continued. <laughs> to be continued. So why don't we continue it? I'll read uh, chapter 10 thoroughly, all the way, verses 1 through 11. And then uh, you take it away in a direction that you want to take it, and we'll see what we what the word gives us today, shall we? Absolutely. All right. A reading from chapter 10 of Revelation, beginning at the first verse. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll of open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel, who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. What do we see there, Pastor Johnson? Uh, well, there's, there's a number of things going on here, um, as always. Uh, for starters, we have this image of an angel that bears uh, some semblance to, to Jesus himself, as he was described in um, chapter one of Revelation, though there's a distinction there. He is one who points to the one who uh, was and is right. and is to come. He, he himself is not that person. So there's a distinction there. Uh, this angel right. is not the, uh, the Lord himself, but, but a, a messenger who is bearing this message. And we see a whole lot of um, Old Testament imagery going on there, uh, especially with the rainbow. For example, what, what are some examples of that Old Testament imagery there? Sorry, yeah, I interrupted um, your pie one would be, sure. Yeah, in verse one, you see right there um, how he is wrapped up in a cloud. Uh, that harkens yeah. back to Exodus, uh, 
uh, with, with God, the, the, the presence of God, uh, the glory of God, the kavod of God coming to be with his people in a cloud, um, leading them as a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night. And so there's that divine presence that is um, coming in the midst of the final trumpet that is about to sound, uh, though the seventh trumpet is, is halted for now. We'll, we'll hear that later on in chapter um, 11, I believe. Um, and then we also, of course, have the rainbow. Uh, the rainbow is the, the wonderful sign that we remember from Noah, uh, the covenant that God made with Noah to never destroy, again, every living thing on the earth. And that's an important thing to remember, especially with a lot of the devastation we just read in chapter 9, um, because here comes a pause in the midst of all this judgment. It's kind of like what we heard in chapter 6. We had the four horsemen and the six seals, and then before the seventh seal was um, unveiled, was opened, uh, there was a pause and there was glory given to God and, and, and singing and praising and were brought into the heavenly throne room. And chapter 10 is kind of like that too, where right before the final trumpet sounds, there's a little interlude here uh, with these powerful images from, from the Old Testament, which would have brought a whole lot of comfort for the, especially for the suffering church, that God is with his people, that God is in control, that his purposes are working themselves out and that the final hammer has not fallen quite yet. Um, so so uh, it gets at what we're focusing on in the, in the church here this year, uh, this time of year, I should say, where we focus on how we are in the end times, right? We, the end times are, are not on the way, but we are caught in the midst of the end times here and now that the life, death and resurrection and the glorious ascension of our Lord has inaugurated the last days. And so we are simply waiting for our Lord to come, which we'll eventually get to uh, when we get to Revelation chapters 20 through 22. So again, there's some really mm -hmm. powerful Old Testament imagery there um, that, uh, that is being employed to draw our attention to, to God's power, but also to God's mercy, um, that he leads his people beside still waters, um, and that is to come. Uh, another thing to point out as well is that final image, I mean, there's a, some other things going on in the middle there, uh, but that final <laughs> image of, of um, John eating a scroll, uh, we hear that in the prophet Ezekiel, where Ezekiel does something very similar, where he eats a scroll that is bitter to his, to his stomach. And this is going to lead us, ultimately prop us up for chapter 11, um, which points us to the, to the purpose of the church to witness. And the church has both the law and the gospel, the law which condemns and can be bitter, uh, and also the gospel which is sweet and full of mercy. And something else going on there, I think, too, is that because the church bears in her bosom, um, on her words, it, the gospel, that means um, suffering will come as well. Uh, certainly there's suffering by virtue of living in a fallen world, what we kind of heard in chapter 9. Um, but also there's a special sort of suffering that comes to God's people because of the gospel that we bear, that we believe in, uh, the Lord that we follow. And it's, it's full of joy, uh, but it's also bitter because the hatred and the ire of many of the nations uh, very well may come down upon the church as the early church experienced in large measure in a number of parts of the ancient world and still does today. So those are just some initial thoughts uh, where, where I was drawn to in, in Revelation chapter 20, chapter 10. Yeah, good. Thank you. I, you know, I was looking at the, the larger sweep of where we're at in Revelation, uh, starting, I should have uh, thought of the actual chapters where this all started, but uh, in the, in chapter five and six, uh, we have the scroll, we have the seven seals, seven seals are being opened. And when the seventh, and those seven seals are doing different things, uh, the seals, you know, bring forth the horsemen uh, who are, you know, the horsemen are, are symbols and, um, you know, what do I want to say? They're, 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 they're coloring uh, and they're, um, voca their coloring is symbolic of their calling uh, to, be, to be deaf, to be, you know, various kinds of afflictions. And then, there's the um, the vision of the of the souls under the altar. There's earthquakes and the shaking of the earth. And then the seventh seal is opened, 
and the seven seals open, then we start having seven trumpets. And it, with each trumpet, new afflictions are falling upon the, the earth. And, um, and we had the sixth, the sixth trumpet just last week in which we had these really wild, wild mounted troops coming forth after the four angels are released from the river Euphrates, from where they are bound by the river Euphrates. And there's just, there's just all kinds of affliction falling upon the whole earth, upon the whole creation, uh, all of it happening under the direction of God. I mean, all of it happening at, at God's permission. Um, and, uh, and it just seems to be that, that what's happening, and, and right now there's this, there's this sort of this little moment where we're pausing and we have this angel, this beautiful image of an angel who's big enough to put one foot in the sea, the other on the land, um, who is who's giving, who's just having almost a personal conversation with John. And so we're getting, kind of given a bit of a breather in the midst of this, this sweep of all these calamities falling upon the earth. It really does suggest, it doesn't suggest, I mean, it, it preaches and declares that when God fulfills his intentions for creation, part of that fulfillment is the suffering of the earth, the suffering of all who dwell therein, right? Uh, I mean, this, this goes to Romans chapter 8. He subjected the creation to futility in the hope, right, of its liberation. Mm -hmm. um, and so... What do we think about that, Pastor? I mean, what do we think about God bringing about the fulfillment of creation in part, at least to some measure, through afflictions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it's an important thing, especially for some of the, as, as we think about the original context first, um, particularly for some of those churches that were a little little too comfortable, uh, who were a little too cozy with paganism, uh, with idolatry, a little too permissive on their own in some of the false teachings and doctrines that were in and around their cities. So on the one hand, it's, it's, a, it's a, a warning to them that God's wrath is real um, and that God does take seriously um, his his call to bring about a a just world and in doing that mm -hmm. there is going to be um, suffering because of course we know as human creatures we are um, by nature sinful and and unjust and we 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 insist on our own way rather than God's way and so because uh, because God is seeking to bring about the the consummation of all things in Jesus um, the, these are like the birth pains that we heard about this weekend you know in, in Mark chapter 13, yeah. that because all of creation um, suffers because of human sin, um, as God is trying to bring about the, the new world, the, the beautiful world, the perfect world, um, it, it's painful, just like a woman giving birth to a beautiful child. Um, it's painful for the woman. And, and, but when that child comes, all that pain, all that suffering, all that agony uh, was worth it. And so I think that's maybe one way to think of this. As we look at some of the um, some of the suffering that is coming upon the world, um, is that this is uh, God is at work in the midst of all of this, ultimately to bring about something even more beautiful than before, um, even better than than Eden, um, as a, a one author would would put it. So, I, th I think that's a helpful um, background to have um, that this suffering is because of sin. Um, but also that God is, is, is trying to rectify things, trying to make things right. And in the process of making things right, bringing about a, per, a, a perfect world in which truth and grace reigns, um, there's going to be some things that are shaken up in this old world. And that includes the natural world around us, but also um, we ourselves as sinful human beings. We often speak uh, about sin as being so closely inhering to the person. Sin is so closely wrapped up in our, in our persons that it can only be ultimately separated by death and resurrection. 
that uh, through union with Jesus Christ and holy baptism, as the Holy Scriptures declare and promise, uh, we are, our sin is passed over, our sin is forgiven, and we are marked for that final redemption of death and resurrection in which our whole person is finally uh, purified and, and saved from, from the actual effects of sin, that, that we can't get that out of ourselves. Sin abides in our hearts. Uh, Jesus covers that through his mercy as we trust in him in this life. At the, at the end of our lives, sin is eradicated. And um, also, of course, when Jesus comes again, uh, that's that for those living also who have trusted him, that is the, their liberation from sin too. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are left will be caught up with them uh, to meet the Lord in the air, and then we'll always be together rejoicing, as St. Paul writes about in Thessalonians. But uh, First Thessalonians, but um, uh, I, you know, you just wonder if we can't connect, if we aren't supposed to connect that with what we see happening here too, that the whole creation is being purified, uh, that the devil mm -hmm. is being bent, and these afflictions are being bent towards God's purposes of purifying the world, preparing the world for the fulfillment. Because especially this final, these final verses in verse in chapter nine, which lead, lead into ten, the rest of mankind who are not killed by these plagues did not repent, which would suggest that that mm -hmm. was the intent <laughs> that they would, uh, or that was at least what God wishes to bring out of this that they would that they would repent, and they didn't do so, and so God is preparing us even through these sufferings, and. So that what that calls for from us in terms of our daily piety and our daily faith is patience in the midst of afflictions. It um, calls us to such faith that even in the midst of afflictions, we would expect good from God and that we would see, and that we know there's a limit to this, that, that God is not unleashed in his anger, but has set limits upon it. And since this is under his command and control, his, his permission giving, his loosing and binding, um, that we may trust that we will not be destroyed, that we will not perish in the midst of whatever afflictions are laid upon us. And to me, that gives me great comfort and hope when things start getting rough in life uh, and, and they call mm -hmm. me to that patience that sort of is willing to sit a while with my afflictions and and be with you know be faithful in the midst of them and be attentive to god in the midst of them yeah. that's what i'm hearing you know and when i'm thinking about how this uh how this shapes our lives as we hear it today the the holy scriptures here we still haven't heard the seventh trumpet, though. And and go ahead. No, we'll we'll get there soon. But but also just to, to kind of piggyback at what what you were talking about, Pastor. Um, you mentioned Romans chapter eight and you know the cosmic birth pangs that the the, the world is under. Um, but then also that we as Christians as, as we endure suffering too. Uh, another good place to go is Romans five, right? That um, through suffering we receive endurance endurance produces character per character produces hope so so suffering yeah. is not um meaningless for the christian certainly for the entirety of creation but especially for the christian that's if if and when suffering comes our way it's not meaningless it it, it, right. it can be redemptive and of course for yeah. that we look to to our lord jesus who suffered greatly for us um so yeah. I, again just another word of comfort um, that that suffering that we go through it is not meaningless and uh, one day will will be redeemed and rectified and so another just important place to go to as we as we think yeah, about some great. of these um, absolutely in the world well and it, I mean I know that this is not necessarily um, 
this is not all that is being said in the comments about the scroll being both honey to the taste and bitter to the stomach. But it does, it does relate in that, uh, if I may sort of, I guess, borrow that imagery uh, to continue this, this point, that there are, sufferings are bitter, uh, but there's all, this, is, this is the honey in the midst of the sufferings, the promise that, that God will accomplish good through these sufferings for our sake and for the sake of creation, and is ultimately accomplishing and fulfilling his divine, saving, merciful, transformative purpose for the whole creation. And um, yeah, so it's, it's like, and you know, you know, people might hear that and say, well, that sounds kind of harsh. I mean, why should it be this way for us? Uh, this is the cross. It, it, it was this way for God also. Um, Jesus himself is subjected to suffering and affliction for the sake of redemption. It's a pattern that is fulfilled in his flesh and his body. Uh, he is no, he is a well acquainted with sufferings and is no stranger to them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's not sort of God up in his heavens sort of looking down on us. It's, it, this is the God who's entered into these afflictions himself and subjected himself to the futility to which mm -hmm. all creation has been subjected. And so, um, we have one who may sympathize with us, and that's all the more a reason to, to say, repent. Uh, every time there's an affliction, every time there's suffering, repent. Uh, remember that you are dust. To dust you shall return yep. and turn again to your Father. So, anything else in yep. chapter 10 that we want to unpack, Pastor? Uh, I think just the, the last verse is really important. Um, right. I was told you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. And one of the things that I see there is just mm -hmm. how uh, the, the message of Christ, the gospel, is a message which all the world needs to hear. Uh, and sometimes that just goes without saying, you know, it's just we're kind of pointing out the obvious but sometimes we need to point out the obvious again and again just so we don't forget it or neglect it that this this message of the gospel which can be bitter but ultimately is is sweet because it's all about god's mercy found in christ um it's got to go all over the place right um every yeah. tribe and nation and language needs to hear this good news it's a message of of international uh global and, and indeed cosmic importance um, and I think that's just an, an important thing to remember, too, that, um, I mean, passages like this and other passages, like from Mark chapter 13, that the, the gospel must go out to all the nations. Um, again, right. we heard that this past weekend is you know, some of the, the impetus behind uh, the, the missionary movement of the church, that everybody needs to hear this message. Um, God wants to deliver this good news of the gospel through his church um, to as many people as possible until that final day. Uh, and so again, that just goes to show that our work as the church matters, whether we're in central Wisconsin mm -hmm. or Minnesota or in a big city like Milwaukee, Chicago, or even if we are going to somewhere in, in the far flung regions of the world, um, that the gospel has to go out. This is God's will that the gospel go mm -hmm. out and radiate to all the, all the peoples and all the nations to free them from their sin. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, thanks for not letting us pass over that. That is significant promise being made to John. Uh, he's sealing up that little scroll and not saying what's in it yet, or what he saw, heard, hears from the angel, and yet he will prophesy to yet more nations and languages and kings. How about I read chapter 11, verses 1 through 14, and then you lead us in its conversation. Uh, chapter 11, verse 1. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. <clears throat> Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses 
and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon come. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. All right, so one question that's on everyone's mind is who are these two witnesses? <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. Who are they? Yeah, yeah. Who are these? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think... Any uh, thoughts on that? One of the ways to, yeah, I think one of the ways to understand um, the two witnesses in Revelation 11 um, is to to look at that as as the church. The church are the church is the two witnesses. Are the two witnesses? Whatever the proper, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, whatever the proper verb would be there. Uh, the, the, the church is, because they are going out. But like Jesus sent the, the the apostles and the and the disciples out two by two. The, 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 the apostles and the 70 leaders he sent them out two by yeah. two so the church goes yeah. out likewise to to bear that message and, and so here is as we heard at the end of john uh, of revelation chapter 10 that they must prophesy about these things here goes the church to prophesy uh, about some of these things and great suffering comes upon them um, and so in, in chapter 11 you hear a number of different uh um, a number of different numbers, um, 40 and 2, yeah. uh, 1260, three and a half days. Um, so you're, you're getting some, some stock apocalyptic imagery from Zechariah, uh, from Daniel, from, from Ezekiel. And so this is, this is just, you know, here's, here's John's prophetic Im imagination just being unleashed um, to, to help to, to show the church that precisely because you you bear this wonderful message, um, yes, God will punish those who who kill you, um, but this could mean untold. You know, this could this could mean a lot of suffering for you, right? For, for um, like in verse two, uh, as he's measuring the temple, do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it's given over to the nations. And they, the nations, will trample the holy city for 42 months and will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 1, days clothed in sackcloth. And so the church is going out, the two witnesses, uh, it's going to bring suffering, it's going to bring, it's going to bring death. Um, as we heard about the martyrs earlier in Revelation, um, this is just the reality of, of the church that we living in between the times.
great suffering will come because of, of the gospel, that some people, some nations, tribes, and languages don't want to hear this. Uh, God will redeem them, will resurrect them. So there's that promise of resurrection at the, at the end of this section, um, verses 11. Um, after the three and a half days, a breath of life of God entered them and they stood up on their feet. And so, so there is redemption to come in the midst of the suffering again. But the suffering um, is, is it's, it's not sugarcoated here. Uh, that, you know, to, to follow Jesus Christ is not as some popular televangelist would say, it's, it's, it's not about your best life now. Um, I mean, it is the good life. We, we talked about that in a Bible study of, you know, about a year ago, that the, the Christian faith is the good life. Um, but it's not looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. It, it takes stock of the reality of the fallen world we live in. And because we are Christian, there will be a certain amount of suffering that will come our way. Um, it's, it's, it's unavoidable um, for, for many of us. That's just when, one thing talking, that comes you know, there's, to there's mind a, in this section. Yeah, so when you say, first of all, when you say John's prophetic imagination, uh, you're not thinking that John just dreams this stuff up in, in, of his own accord. He's given these visions from God, right? Right, yeah, he's given, he, yeah, right. he's given God, these visions. Uh, but also, John, he was, he was raised and steeped in the scriptures, and so he has... Mm -hmm. um he he's he knows what these visions mean um so it's not that god is giving them a whole bunch of visions he has no idea what to make out of them god gives him these visions right and he understands them because he's steeped so deeply in the scriptures right so god is giving john these visions john understands the visions because he is steeped in the scriptures he's also of course tutored by our lord jesus christ himself in the interpretation of scripture that was and awesome. um yeah and and so he you know when he's, when he's going to measure this temple uh he said he's told to measure the temple that recalls really specifically the language of ezekiel where there is this measuring of of the of the new temple right and so the temple okay. is it is the place of god the temple is the place where the believers and god are together the temple of course is the body of christ we're told this in the gospel of john uh, when Jesus talks about raising his temple, or raising the temple in three days, uh, he's talking about his resurrection, the resurrection of his body after three days. And then outside of that body, outside of that body, that is unbelievers. So believers are the body of Christ. They reside in the body of Christ, which is his temple. Outside of the temple are the unbelievers. And then we have 42 months which is of course three and a half years, right? And you pointed that out that we have three and a half, and this is stock Old Testament imagery. But why? But why is it? And John starts revealing that to us as he's recording these revelations from God. One thousand two hundred and sixty days is equivalent to forty-two times thirty, and so you have forty-two months. That's three and a half months, and then later on we're told that after three and a half days in verse eleven. The two witnesses, which I think you really correctly identified with the church, are raised up. So, you know, to me, what that is saying, and this is in line with, with the tradition of scriptural interpretation here, um, Jesus is raised after three days. This is then the three and a half is a, is a symbolic numbering of the second resurrection that um as christ is raised now the church is raised but christ first he has the resurrection and then the church has the inherited resurrection from him so he's a three we're a three and a half if you you know if you want to put it that way and there's definitely a two-ness to the church right because the because throughout the new testament there's always two in the church the, the Jews and the Gentiles, the Jews and the Gentiles. And this is what makes the church so distinct in the ancient world is that people of differing, um, not just differing nations are coming together in sort of our pluralistic diversity infatuation and, and, and concern today, but specifically two different kinds of people who before 
uh, in the religion of this God were separate. They've now been drawn together into this one body. So there's a two-ness to the body of Christ, which is the temple and the two witnesses both Jews and Jewish and Gentile believers uh, witnessing to, to Christ. All of it happening in Jerusalem, which is, we're told, symbolically called, or, or spiritually called, how does it put it? Symbolically is, this is verse um, 8, the great verse city eight. that symbolically yeah. is called Adam and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified, is referring to Jerusalem. So this also has overtones of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Again, reminding us the last days have already begun. The church did suffer in that destruction of Jerusalem as well. Um, and yet the church survives. And the church goes on to preach another day. And again, uh, this is talking about the sufferings of the church throughout history. And at the end of time, the church may die, but the church will rise. The church cannot pass away because it is founded upon the rock, Jesus Christ. And it's just so beautiful how the resurrection of these two witnesses, the church, follows the pattern and mimics the pattern of Christ's own death and resurrection. There's a, there's a, a death and a trampling by Jerusalem. Then there's a resurrection, three and a half, not three days. There's a secondary resurrection. And then there's also the ascension. And this is a beautiful way that the ascension is described here. At the beginning of verse 12, then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. <laughs> and they walked, went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to God in heaven. So again, we see the church, not just Christ being triumphant, but also the church sharing in that triumph. And in the same pattern as Christ shares in it. So as Christ triumphs through affliction, so does the church triumph through its afflictions. And that brings us up to the seventh trumpet in verse 15. And uh, it is after 9 o'clock, almost 9.10. We probably should wrap it up. But any concluding thoughts or comments, Pastor Johnson? No. Um, I guess just one. As you're talking, okay. I was reminded of uh, Tertullian and his in his very remarkable and memorable statement about how the martyrs, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And um, yeah. I think it's just a, a powerful image that the, that the blood that is spilled like Jesus is um, also the blood that's spilled of the martyrs. Um, God is going to use to bring about the conversion of, of many peoples. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great quote to remember at this point. Um, even, in, even in our shedding of our blood, the church grows um, yeah. because, because our Lord no. is, is risen. Uh, now, the Pastor, Lord be I'm with having you. Some, I'm, having some audio, I'm having some audio issues. Are you having the same audio issues that I'm having? Well, you're, you're a little delayed, uh, but I, so far I okay. haven't had anything beyond that but I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pray and then we're going to conclude yes, the please. study. Okay. All right. The Lord be with Thank you. you. Let us and pray also with you. Heavenly father, we thank and praise you for your servant, John, and for the beautiful revelations you gave to him. Truly you are a revealing God who is open to us, your heavenly court and the beauty that dwells therein to the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Grant that we may ever dwell in him and he in us, that we would abide in faith through every affliction and inherit with him the crown of glory. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And the Lord peace be with all of our all of our viewers, uh, be sure to share, invite others to join in this study of Revelation. Have a blessed day.